Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to take a look at an artifact that we haven't previously talked about on the channel, and that is MUI Cache, M-U-I Cache, which stands for Multilingual User Interface. For us, it can be an artifact of execution. In reality, it's a software feature added to previous versions of Windows that allows software localization support. Don't worry if you don't know what that means, we'll cover it in a couple of minutes. In general though, as a reminder, almost every Windows forensic artifact we leverage falls into one of two categories. Number one, something that was put in place to improve the user experience, like MUI cache, like Prefetch, which was put in place to speed up subsequent launches of applications. Or number two, something that was put in place to ensure backwards compatibility with older software, like ShimCache. So almost every artifact we leverage will fall into one of those two categories. Almost none of them were there to be forensic artifacts, right? We're using them for a completely different purpose. You probably already knew that, but it bears repeating. So here's what we're going to do in this episode. We're going to start off with a little background information on how MovieCache grabs the information it uses and populates in a structure. Don't worry, you'll want to see this. It only takes a couple of minutes, so bear with me. Then we're going to take a look at the ARTA facts. If you don't know what that is in a 13 cubed episode, it's kind of like the nutrition facts for an artifact. It's just exactly the right amount of what you need to know about a given artifact. Not too little, not too much, or at least that's the goal. And then lastly, we're going to jump into a live demo and see it in action. Otherwise it wouldn't be a 13 cubed episode without that, right? All right, let's get started. Within a standard portable executable or PE file, which is the executable file format used in Windows, there exists the concept of resource sections. These sections can be viewed with software like PE Studio, as you can see here. One of the resources stored within a PE file is called version info. And as its name implies, it contains metadata for the executable with information such as the company name, the version, of course, copyright information, and other arbitrary data. Why is this important? Well, because MUI Cache actually uses the metadata contained within the version info resource, or at least some of it. Specifically, MUI Cache tracks the company name as application company and the file description as friendly app name. Upon initial program execution, so the first time you run a program, this information is populated in the MUI Cache. So where is the MUI Cache actually stored? Well, it's in the registry. Specifically, it's in usrclass.dat or userclass.dat, which like ntuser.dat is a per user registry hive present within each user's home directory. If that file name sounds familiar, you're probably thinking of shell bags, which is largely stored therein. As a quick review on a live system, you're likely used to seeing hkey current user when you fire up regedit. That's actually a live representation of the ntuser.dat for the user account under which you're currently logged in. But userclass.dat actually plugs in within HKEY current user software classes. So in other words, anything under the classes tree is actually being pulled from userclass.dat. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's take a look at the MUI cache artifacts. MUI cache was introduced way back in Windows 2000 to provide language localizations. What does that mean? Well, it just means that a single executable needs to be able to work no matter which language the user is using. It shouldn't just work in English, for example. What if the user is using Spanish or simplified Chinese or some other language? Obviously, there will need to be some adjustments to that application to make it work in another language because different languages use different character sets, which may use different character widths, which may affect the position of icons or other assets within the window that's being drawn. So the ability to be able to support that same application working across multiple different languages is why something like MUI Cache exists in the first place. But the real question is, why are you here, right? Why are you watching this video? It's not for the history lesson that I'm providing to you. It's for the digital forensic implications of the artifact. And here's the bottom line. It can be used as a per user artifact of execution for GUI based programs. That's why you care. As we already said, it's stored within userclass.dat, and you can see on screen there the two paths within the registry, specifically where you will find the movie cache. We also already mentioned that the company name in the version info section or resource is being recorded 
in the registry as application company and the file description is being recorded as friendly app name. So because this information is being pulled directly from the resource section in the binary itself, that also has another advantage for us. We could take an executable that was, I don't know, evil.exe, right? And we could rename it to not evil.exe to try to disguise what it actually is. But whatever that metadata is inside of the version resource section is actually going to be used to populate that, not what the actual executable is named on the file system. So that could be also another advantage for us. And lastly, for the caveat or the gotcha associated with movie cache, because every artifact seems to have one, right? There is no timestamp associated with the execution. So in other words, movie cache does not record anything other than application company and friendly app name. There's no timestamp of when it entered the cache or when it executed. Now, yes, there are last write timestamps in the registry for keys and sub keys, not for values, but that's not really going to help us out here because again, values don't have last write timestamps. So you'll have to use other artifacts to determine when that particular program you're looking at executed on the system. But still, it is a valuable artifact and something that you can use along with other artifacts to corroborate the information you're looking at or to provide additional context. Okay, so that's pretty much all you need to know about MUI cache. It's not an incredibly complex artifact like shim cache or am cache or something like that. Pretty easy to understand. In fact, it kind of reminds me in simplicity and in what it records of something like recent file cache.bcf, which was a Windows 7 artifact that was the predecessor to am cache. It doesn't record a lot of information, but it can still be kind of useful. Again, I'm not saying these artifacts are the same. It just kind of reminds me of it in that it's a fairly simple artifact, but still could be valuable to you in your investigations. Okay, so there's only one thing left to do, and that's to take a look at this in a live demo. So let's go ahead and hop over to a virtual machine and take a look at this in action. Let's take a look at the files I have on the desktop. Over here, we have apg.exe, which is a very simple GUI password generator that I wrote many years ago. We'll be using this to demo movie cache. But I also have strings.exe and whois.exe, which are sysinternals command line utilities. So why are these here if movie cache is only going to help us track GUI program execution? Well, we'll get to that. Hang around. And then we have movie cache view.exe from Nearsoft, which as the name implies, is a utility that will allow us to view and interact with the movie cache. But we don't really need any special utility to do that. We can just fire up regedit on the live system and take a look at the information ourselves. Now, of course, the same would be true for an artifact like user assist, but remember user assist is a more complex artifact and it doesn't help that the values are ROT13 encoded. Movie cache is far more simple. So let's take a look and I'll show you what I mean. Let's drill down under H key current user, then under software and then classes. So it's underneath this location that user class.dat plugs in. So everything underneath this tree is being pulled from user class.dat. As we continue to drill down, we'll go under local settings. Then the first location I wanna show you is MUI cache. And then you'll see a couple of sub keys here that will be named differently on your system. But this path is where you will find some system-wide binaries like msesc.exe for terminal services client or remote desktop connection as you may be familiar with it. You will also find things like notepad.exe, there's fsquirt.exe and PowerShell ICE right here and so on and so forth. The main location under which you will find most of the information you're probably looking for is going to be here under software. Microsoft, Windows, Shell, and then MUI Cache. By the way, you will note that there is bag MRU in bags. So yes, this is the location of shell bags, but we're not here for that, right? We're here for MUI Cache and there it is. So again, that full path is HKey current user, software classes, local settings, software, Microsoft, Windows, Shell, MUI Cache. And you can see there are a few things here already, even though this is a plain vanilla Windows sandbox system with not a lot going on. So you see shell32 DLL, openwith.exe, escort.exe, but for each of these, you'll notice that there are two values, right? There's application company and friendly app name all the way down, just like we showed you. All right, let's minimize this and launch APG, and then we'll close it. Let's go back, we'll press F5, and there you go. 
So these two things that I've highlighted are what was just added. We have the full path to the binary that just executed. So we've got C users, WDAG utility account, because that's the default account when you're using Windows Sandbox, desktop, apg.exe, and then appended to that, we have application company and friendly app name. Application company is 13 cubed, friendly app name is APG. And as we said, this is being pulled from that version info resource. All right, what happens if we rename apg.exe to, I don't know, how about a.exe? And now let's run it again and close it. Go back, refresh, and is this what you expected to happen? We do have two new entries for a.exe, but note that the data is the same. It still says 13 cubed for the application company and APG for the friendly app name. Were you expecting the friendly app name to change since we renamed it from APG? Well, the reason again why it didn't is because that's being pulled from that internal metadata in the binary itself. Why is this important? Well, have you ever seen a threat actor try to rename a program to something other than what it is to make it fit in or disguise? Well, if they try that with a GUI program and happen to execute it on the system, then you might actually find proof of that within the movie cache. So that's kind of cool. All right, now let's talk about strings and who is. Again, these are command line utilities, not GUI based. What is going to happen if I run these? Well, let's find out. So if I run strings.exe, it runs, no big deal. And if I run who is.exe, it runs. Will these be in the movie cache? No, they will not. However, if this was the first time I'd run these, so let me show you what I mean by that. Let's go under H key current user. Let's go under software. And now let's find sys internals, because remember when you run a sys internals tool and you accept the EULA, the end user license agreement, it actually adds something to the registry. You can see it right here under strings. You can see EULA accepted and under who is, you can see EULA accepted. Let's take both of these sub keys here and delete them. Why does this matter? Well, just bear with me. You'll see. Now let's go back to where we were. Do you remember that path it's under classes, right? And then, well, it's a little bit of a cheat because it's already expanded, but all the way down here is where we were. And so let's go back and let's go back to the command prompt. Now let's run strings.exe again and use forward slash accept EULA to accept it. And it ran. Okay. No big deal. If I refresh it, is it here? It is not. But now what if I run who is, and instead of using forward slash accept EULA, I'll just not put anything and press enter and check it out. A little window popped up. It says who is license agreement. It shows me the license terms and I can print, agree, or decline. Let me go ahead and click agree. Okay, and it shows us the help. Uh, why are you showing me this? You're probably thinking, well, let's go back and refresh and take a look at that. Now, who is.exe is in the movie cache. Why? Well, the reason is literally because of that EULA. When we ran it without forward slash accept EULA, it generated a window that popped up and that in and of itself was enough to affect the behavior such that it entered the movie cache. So I wanted to show you this because there's always little caveats or gotchas or things you need to know with artifacts. So the takeaway here is that if a sys internals utility is run on a system, a command line sys internals utility to be exact, and it's run the first time with the accept EULA coming from that dialogue that pops up instead of from the command line, in other words, someone doesn't type forward slash accept EULA, but instead just clicks it in the little GUI window that pops up, that program will be entered into the movie cache, as you can see right here with who is. So yeah, maybe that's not super important, but I kind of wanted to take you through that to show you the behavior of a sys internals utility. And also as an added bonus, you got to see the location in the registry under which that accept EULA value was stored in case you didn't know that, because that's another great place to look in intuser.dat to determine if a given utility from SysInternals was run by a particular user. So just another good thing to know. So consider that a bonus tip. All right, and then last but not least, let me go ahead and run movie cache view from Nearsoft just to show you that this is a pretty cool utility that will allow you to basically see the same thing, right? This is exactly what we saw in the registry. 
but it is aggregating both locations. So remember, these things that I'm highlighting here all came from that first location in the registry that I showed you. And then everything above that starting here came from the second location. So I just wanted to point out that it aggregates both of those paths in the registry and shows you all of this. And do keep in mind, you can highlight any of these, press delete and delete them. Just that easy. You could do the same in regedit. So from an anti-forensics perspective, absolutely, these things can be deleted. So do keep that in mind. Of course, the registry is an allocated structure. So there is the concept of unallocated space in the registry. And it is possible to recover deleted keys and subkeys and values from the registry. But I just wanted to point out that from an anti-forensic standpoint, absolutely, these things could be deleted. The same holds true with prefetch, of course, or just about any other artifact for that matter. So there is a way to clean up after themselves if a reactor so chose. But remember, the good thing about this is this is a rather obscure artifact, and there are so many different artifacts in Windows, which is the great thing about it. So chances are that a threat actor, even one cleaning up after themselves, is probably not going to remember to cover 100% of their tracks. There's probably going to be something left behind somewhere they can give you at least some idea about what was going on on the system. So that's pretty much all I wanted to show you in this episode. I hope that you found this information informative and useful. And as always, thanks for watching. If you're not yet subscribed to 13 Cubed, would you consider doing so? It really helps the channel grow and I would greatly appreciate it. But yeah, aside from that, hey, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.